What do we do until he comes? Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 37, Jesus is in the middle of a conversation and he says, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Go down with me to verse 41. Peter said, Lord, Are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Let's pray. Father, thank you. So much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Y'all, one of the coolest things about having kids is um, people don't look at me funny anymore when I go to see animated movies. Um, You know, because I got children with me. I I look right. I love animated movies. Always have. Probably always will. Went and saw this movie called Inside Out 2 with the boys. Oh, okay. Right room. All right. Okay. Um, Inside Out 2. It was it was awesome. It was fun. Um, really, I'm probably going to preach that when we do at the movies again because, boy, listen, almost had a praise party in when Joy walks in on exactly. Listen. Okay. Another time. Anyway, part of the movie, there's this guy who's got a bag and whatever you need, you can pull out the bag. And friends, that guy is cool, but we got somebody like that on our staff. Her name is Liz. Whatever we need is in her bag. Uh, One day we needed thread scissors, and I asked for thread scissors, and she just go into her bag, and for some reason, she got thread scissors. I need a a Kleenex or wipe for my glasses. She, She ain't even wearing glasses, and she got a cleaner for the glasses in her bag. Whatever we need is in her bag. She is always ready. You know, our biblical passage this morning is Jesus through parables explaining to his disciples and those who are listening what they need to do as the end draws near. He is explaining to them the necessity of this moment. And and here's the big idea of what Jesus is saying to them is that God wants you to live ready. So many times, friends, we want to get ready when the opportunity arrives. But if you try to get ready when the opportunity arrives, you will miss the moment. God wants you to live a life ready and a life that is prepared. I want to show you four things from this passage that I believe that God is calling us to live, ways God is calling us to live ready. Number one, we need to live ready for his return. You know, they used to sing this song, some glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away. My grandmother, um, uh, the one who has passed on, she used to sing this song, ready or not, my Lord is coming, ready or not, he's coming again. Trim your lamp and keep it burning Ready or not, he's coming again. Here's the truth. We don't know the day or the hour, but we need to be ready for when he comes. You know, my wife, um, it's it's so funny. Um, She loves for our house to look like nobody lives in it. (laughs) And I'm like, babe, (laughs) you know, people know that we live here. (laughs) Nope. If, If you go to our house right now, it looks like it's ready for to be shown. Like nobody lives here. There is not a fork out of place. There's not a spoon out of place. Uh, no one has sat on that couch and forever. Everything is just prepared for surprise guests. Prepared for the rain that may fall. <laughs> it's always prepared. We've got to be prepared for the day Jesus comes. And here are a couple of ways that you can be prepared. Number one, you need to be in personal relationship with Jesus. 
You got to be in personal relationship with him. Notice what the scripture says. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds. Oh, wait, here, here's what he is saying is that when he comes, you've already got to be in relationship with him. This is not something that you do once he comes. You've got to be in relationship with him before he comes because he's coming for his servants and his church. That, that's what he's coming, the rapture. And so real practically, and we're, we're going to do this again at the end. If you're in the room or in our video venue and you're here for the first time or maybe you're exploring faith, here, here's what relationship with Jesus is like. It's just acknowledging and admitting your need for him. That I, I know I need, I need a savior. It is putting, saying I believe in that savior. It's not enough to just acknowledge him, but you got to believe him and put your faith and trust in him and then verbalize that. Here's what R Romans 10 and 9 says. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and was rose again, then you will be saved. That, that's how you get in personal relationship with him. It's not, oh, I got to do a, a list of good things. No, no. If you could do it on your own, you would have done it. You need the Lord's help and be in personal relationship with him. Now, what's interesting here, that word awake in the Greek, um, I, I thought about trying to attempt to pronounce it, but I figured y'all be distracted by me stuttering. So it starts with a G. You can go look it up. Um, here's what that word actually means. It's not just awake. It it means to be on guard or alert, to be, to be ready, to be head on a swivel, right? And here's where we need to be on guard for. We need to be on guard for false teaching, friends. Now more than ever, we've got to be careful about what we consume. And, and my daddy says it like this. The devil only lies when it's almost true. And here, here's how false teaching goes. It gives you enough sprinkle of truth that, hmm, that sounds good. But the other ingredients are so bad for you. You know what uh, my grandmother used to say? If, if you can't pronounce what's on the label, don't eat that. And we got to be careful what we consume. In fact, just practically, I would challenge you, you need to guard your gates, guard your ear, and guard your eyes. Because, because what you consume is what you will become and is what you will be discipled by. The, the other thing that we need to be alert or on guard for is for his return. Here's what scripture says, to look up for your redemption draws nigh, or your, your redemption draws near. So we, we need to be looking for his return, being prepared, be alert to know that when, when he comes, I'm ready. Here's the second part, though. Not only do we need to live ready for his return, but we need to live ready for him not to return in your lifetime. And so many times we want to be here or there. What God is calling us to do is man in the tension of he can come at any moment and he may not come in your lifetime. And this is not a tension to solve. It's a tension to manage. That I've got to live like he's coming today and live like he may not come in my lifetime. Notice what it says, Luke 12 and 38. He says he may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn. You don't know. And since you don't know when Jesus is going to come, you have to keep on living. And he gives us instructions for this. In Luke 19 and 3, he says, occupy until he comes. To live. Now, um, I'm going to have a t-shirt made. Um, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. <laughs> and one of the most out of context verses is Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. That's true. Can I tell you the context of that verse? 
They were like, God, please get me out of here. He says, no, I want you to stay right where you are because I've got plans for your life. Sometimes you're trying to pray yourself out of the very place that God says, this is the place that I want you to be. This is where I've called you to. And so, and, and, and let me just say this. Uh, we, I, I'm so proud to be an American citizen. I'm, I'm proud. I can't wait to win all these goals, right? I'm so glad to be of Jamaican descent, and we're going to win a few of them in, in track. That, that's cool. But can I tell you, none of that matters in comparison to the fact that I'm a citizen of heaven and that this world is not my home and one day I'm going to glory. That, that anything you put in front of Christian devalues your main assignment. You are not a black Christian or a white Christian. You are not a conservative Christian. You are a believer in Jesus Christ and everything else after. And he gives us instructions on how to live in this world. Here, here's what he says in Jeremiah 29, 5 through 7. They said, God, I don't want to stay here. God said, stay. I got a plan. Here's my instructions to you. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. It's too many Christians sitting in the house just waiting for Jesus to come. Here, here, here's how they used to say it in the old church. You so heavenly minded, you know earthly good. Friends, God has called us to do something while we are here until he comes. He, he didn't call you to just sit and chill and wait until he comes. No, he said, do not decrease. You need to multiply here. I, I know it's so much easier to complain about what's happening. And, but can I tell you what I do? I pray for everybody. The people I like and the people I don't like. The... the I, I, I pray for everybody. Here's why, especially those in leadership, because as they lead, if they, God gives them a grace, it actually benefits us. No, notice what he says. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you and pray to Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, you will find your welfare. God has called us not to disengage, but to engage in our community. Don't, don't, don't back up. God has called you to get in the game. If I could sum it up, God wants you to build. God wants you to build. I'm, I'm going to challenge you. Too many of us settle for so less than what God has for us. God has called you to build, to build homes and a career, to build a legacy for your children and your families. To, to build your families, to build friendships, to build bridges and opportunities to serve people. It's one of the reasons why we're doing a Hope Center here is because we're, we're not just going to complain about the condition of our city. We're going to engage and be a part of changing lives in our city. You know, uh, we just went to Guatemala and Bobby is here. And if you know anything about Bobby, listen, Bobby's going to get it done. Bobby is going to get it done. Whatever you task him with, he's going to get it done. And we went down to Guatemala, and there's a project that we're a part of down there. We're building, um, being a part of building a clinic that's going to serve the whole region. A clinic that is going to take care of their health needs, their dental needs. It's going to be absolutely incredible. I can't wait to show it to you. But we got there, and we expected that the building was supposed to be almost done. And we got there... And no work is being done. And now we could have easily said, oh, I can't believe this. We already paid these jokers and they ain't doing nothing with the money and blah, blah, blah. You know what Bobby and them did? Those guys got together and said, we're going to get to work. 
and they started putting up the framing and the sheetrock. And by the time they started working, the rest of the crew that was supposed to be there saw them working and they got involved and engaged. And now the project has accelerated not because they complained, but because they got to work and what was on the inside of them was contagious to those around them. Maybe God wants you in your city because what's on the inside of you got to get on everybody else. You know, you may not like your job, but God may like what you are doing at your job and the influence that you have at your job. God wants us to build. And he wants us to be a part of what he's doing in the earth. Here, here, here's the third thing. We need to live ready and willing to be used by God. Now, now, so many of us are willing and ready to do personal things. But we need to be willing and ready to be used for God's purposes in the earth. You know, we have what I would describe as a labor shortage in the earth. We have a kingdom labor shortage. No, notice what Jesus says about it. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. He says to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. Can I tell you um, the number one thing that our serve team asked me to do on Sundays is will you tell the people that we need some help? You know what's, what, what's interesting is so many of us enjoy the blessings of God, but we don't always like to participate in being a blessing for God. Everybody wants to be on the receiving end. But how many of us, what, what if the best thing God does is not for you, but through you? What, what if the best thing God does with your life is not what he blesses you with, but how he uses you to be a blessing to others? Do, I, and so many of you, you enjoy Mountain West. You love Mountain West. You, you, you enjoy this. Can I tell you, you haven't seen the best of Mountain West until you're on the other side of it when you're a part of creating the environment that you love so much, when, when you actually say, wait a minute, I was a part of what happened in that person's life. When, when you are serving on the baptism team and you realize their story and how they got here and how you played a, a role in helping them take their next step towards God. I, I just want to challenge you. If this is a place that you call home, this is a place that you attend and that you receive from. I want to challenge you to be a part of participating in creating the environment that you love so much. To, to be willing and ready. Here's all throughout scripture. We see God say stuff like this. Who will I send? Who, who, who will go for me? Who will be used by me? Who, who can I send? People have asked me constantly, you know, what, what has been the secret to what the Lord has done in your life? I, I'm not the most talented. I'm not the most gifted. I'm not, you know what's been, what I believe, what has allowed the, the hand of the Lord's favor to be on my life is that God, I say yes, wherever, whenever, however, and you will get all the credit for whatever happens in my life. God is looking for people who are willing and available. If you're willing and available, God will do something in your life. Not only willing, though, there's got to be some fruit in your life, too. Here, here's what he says. He says he is looking for the faithful and wise manager, right? The one who is willing and faithful, but also the one, and here's what wisdom, is knowing what to do based on the circumstance you're in. Wisdom is making the best choice based on the circumstances that you're in. And wisdom creates fruit. And here, here's what I know. If you're fruitful, God will give you greater opportunities and positions of authority. Here, here's what Matthew 25, 29 says. 
to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. The truth is, friends, God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of principles. And sometimes you're upset about somebody else getting promoted. And it's really not about if you are faithful and fruitful where you are, your gifts will make room for you. And instead of hating on somebody who's been promoted, you need to go to them and say, hey, can you teach me on how I can be more fruitful and the, the strategies that you have? Here, here's what I've learned. Your availability and productivity causes God to give you greater opportunity. When you are open to what the Lord wants to do, and you are productive right where he already has placed you, it will create greater opportunities for you. And God wants to use you to do incredible things. I, I think, and I know sometimes we dream way too small. We really do. We dream entirely too small. And not, not only too small, we dream entirely too selfish. Selfish. Here's another one for you. I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Um, the Lord will give me the desires of my heart. Can you just scroll up in the Bible app just a little bit? The verse right before that says, if you delight yourself in him, then he will give you the desires of your heart. If your desire is the Lord, you can get that. If your desire is his will, he will give you that. But not just a flippant, oh, I can get whatever I want. Friends, that's a genie. That's not God. He, he's looking for somebody who will dream big kingdom dreams that doesn't care who gets the credit, but does care that he gets the glory. Here's the fourth and final thing, friends, is we've got to live to help people get ready for God. Christ's return. Here's what the scripture says. Who then is faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? God, God wants his church to help the world get ready for his return. You know, uh, Jesus, when he was getting ready to go, here, here were his final words to them. It's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission. This is how we get people ready for Christ's return. There's a few parts of this. Here's the first one. God has called us to go after his lost kids. You know, one of the things I'm going to be praying for for this 21 days of prayer is that God would give our church a burden again for his heart. And the number one thing on God's prayer list is his lost kids. You know, we went to we went to Disney last year and while we were there we got ready for the parade and y'all it's hot. It's hot, 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 hot. If you want to hear about hell, come back the next, last week. But if you want to experience it, go to Florida. Um, anyway, we're at Disney. And the parade comes by and everything is good. I turn my back for a quick second to check on two of our boys. And somewhere in the middle of it, MoJ walks away from us. Friends, I've never felt fear like I felt in that moment. My son was lost. And all I cared about was finding him. Can, can I tell you something that you, you may judge me? I wasn't thinking 
about the other two kids. I wasn't thinking about what they may have for dinner or anything else. All that consumed my mind was finding my lost son. Because I knew if he didn't get found, he'd be lost forever. Can, can I, I lean in? Please hear me. So many of us, we live like agnostic Christians. Here's how we live. We live like the words of Scripture are just words of another book. And we, we do not live with the burden of the truth of those words. That family member that you love, if they don't know Jesus, they will be lost forever. That coworker you laugh with every week, if they don't know Jesus, they will be lost forever. We should have a burden to share the good news. We should have a burden for God's lost kids. Because if people matter to God, they should matter to us. And I know so many times we, we, we want to vilify those who don't know Christ and sometimes they, they, they make fun of us. Can I tell you, they did the same thing to Jesus. While he was hanging on the cross, they mocked him. And here's what Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They're not just, they're not evil or bad kids. They're just lost kids that need to know their father. They need to know their heavenly father. That, that's got to be our heart. To find those far from him. And here's what we do. When, when they're found, we make disciples out of all those who are found. We make disciples out of all those who are found. We model it, we encourage it, we evaluate it, and we repeat it. You can't lead somebody where you've never been. But you can invite them on a journey. We activate the found and go and do likewise. And I, I, I told y'all, y'all haven't experienced the best of Mountain West. Can I tell you, you haven't experienced your favorite Mountain West service yet. Can I tell you what your favorite one is going to look like? It's going to be the day that you invite your friend who needs Jesus to church. And you know, you're, you're going to walk in a little nervous because you love Mountain West, but you're, you're not sure how they're going to feel. And you're not going to say this to my face, but you're going to be like, I hope they got the right worship team today, and I hope they sing the right songs. And please, Lord, let Pastor Mo be funny today, and let, let him not say anything weird, please. And we're going to get to the end of the gathering. And we're going to get to the point where I present Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell everybody to close their eyes, but you ain't going to, you're going to only close one because you're peeking over at your friend, excited because this is the moment. And that day when your friend, your sister, your brother, your parent, your loved one, hears the message of Jesus and they raise their hand, there is something that's going to happen on the inside of you that will change everything forever. This is why we invite. This is why we are intentional. It's because this is what Jesus has called us to do until he returns. To reach those who are far from God. To disciple those who have been found to activate those disciples and to go and do it again. I want to challenge you. In this season, don't stand on the sidelines about what God is doing. Be a part of doing what God has called us to do until he returns. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. Here's what I know. In a room like this, in our video venue, there are people who need Jesus. And 
Following Jesus is not about you getting yourself right. It's about you trusting Jesus to make you right. Difference between Christianity and every other religion is that every other religion is about what you can do. And Christianity is about what Jesus has done for you. And you receiving that. So in this room, every eye closed, every head bowed. If you know you need to make it right with the Lord, if, if you need Jesus today, would you just slip your hand up right where you are? Slip your hand up. I, I need the Lord. I see that hand. I see that hand. I need the Lord. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see. I need Jesus. I need to be in right relationship with him. I see those hands. I see those hands. Yes. I need to be in right relationship with him. Hallelujah. Today is your day. Come on, let's pray, friends. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this day. We thank you that you are calling us to be ready. Calling us to be ready for your return. Thank you for reminding us, God, that we have work to do while we're here. Help us to be open and willing and ready for what you want us to do. And Lord, would you refocus the church on the mission that you've called us to? God, I pray for all the hands that went up in this room, God. I thank you today that you have saved and done life transformation. And Father, I pray even for the person who is not ready to put their hand up, but they know in their heart today is their day. And if you put your hand up in, or if you know in your heart today is your day, I want you to say this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, save me. Change me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I believe that you died and that you rose again. And today I put my faith in you. Jesus, make me new. And Father, I just pray over your people today. I pray today would be a day of miracles. Today would be a day that we surrender it all to you and put our faith and trust in you in every area of our lives so that you can get the glory, honor, and praise out of everything that we do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And every heart say amen. Amen and amen. Come on, let's put our hands together one more time for Jesus.